do you like having church first? It's been kind of fun. Uh, this is good now because I'm on the clock. Uh, I have to be done by 11. So I have set a timer. I will not go over, maybe. <laughs> no, I won't. Uh, I just was looking at my bird app. For any of you that are nature lovers and birders, uh, there's this really cool bird app that you can just uh, open up and push a button and it will listen for sounds. And there's a chipping sparrow. Of course, you can hear the geese occasionally uh, as well honking. But there's other birds uh, around here as well. So I want to ask, what do you see? What do you hear? What do you feel being outside, uh, being close to what God has made for us? It's so wonderful to be out here. And um, I can't say that I take the credit for this idea. This goes all the way back to when I was a student in high school, uh, the academy that I went to. Am I echoing a little bit? Is there a little bit of feedback? Anyway. They would take us up to uh, Sabbath in the Smokies, and we would go outside up to Mount Pisgah off of the Blue Ridge Parkway once a year. They would take the whole school, we'd get in buses, and we'd go up there, and there's a little grassy area, and we'd sit under the uh, kind of the, the shadow, not really shadow, but underneath uh, Mount Pisgah, which is a very tall, prominent mountain, almost 6,000 feet in elevation. Uh, some of you probably been there, and I just remember how special it was to be outside, to sing, to pray, and to just spend the day uh, together. We go for a hike afterwards, uh, but one of the things that we have here that we did not have up in the mountains is this beautiful lake here with lots of birds. Uh, so uh, you can go different places and have different things. But I wanted to share with you uh, just briefly here uh, a few things. I was looking in the spirit of prophecy and looking at some of the, the blessings of the Sabbath and being outdoors in particular. And there were several things that were very striking to me. Uh, this one statement is from Signs of the Times, May 20, 1886. And it says, the Sabbath was made to be a blessing to man by calling his mind from secular labor to contemplate the goodness and glory of God. And then uh, she writes, it is necessary that the people of God assemble for his worship to interchange thoughts in regard to the truths of his word and to devote a portion of time to prayer. But these seasons, now listen to this, but these seasons, even upon the Sabbath, should not be made tedious by their length and lack of interest. I just got rebuked there a little bit uh, for length. So noted, took, took note of that, but lack of interest. And then here's the next sentence. During a portion of the day, all, how many are all? All is all of us should have an opportunity to be out of doors. You know, we could have 100 meetings at church all day and they could all be good meetings. But if we miss the opportunity to be outside, we would miss a blessing that God wants all of us to have, young and old. So that was one statement. Uh, here's another one uh, from a letter in 1895, and it says, Consider the lilies of the field. We can have no better lesson book than nature. I think Sister Carolyn just referred to that earlier in our prayer time. We can have no better lesson book than nature. And it continues, Consider the lilies of the field. She's quoting Jesus. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Let the minds of your children be carried up to God. It is for this that he has given us the seventh day and left it as a memorial of his created works. And then one more, one more paragraph. I think this was the most uh, powerful of all uh, as it relates to what we're doing here today. This is from the book Education, page 251. And it, and it says, since the Sabbath is the memorial of creative power, it is the day above all others when we should acquaint ourselves with God through his works, the things he has made. In the minds of the children, the very thought of the Sabbath should be bound up with the beauty of natural things. Happy is the family who can go to the place of worship on the Sabbath as Jesus and his disciples went to the synagogue across the fields, along the shores of the lake. Of course, that reminds me, here we are today, along the shores of the lake, 
or through the groves. Happy the father and mother who can teach their children God's written word with illustrations from the open pages of the book of nature. Who can gather? Okay. Uh, and then this is the final uh, sentence. Who can gather under the green trees in the fresh air, pure air, to study the word and to sing the praise of the father above? So it just talks about the value and significance and blessing from being in the things that God has created around us. And so that's why we're here. So um, let me just share briefly this morning, uh, what are some object lessons that God has given to us in nature? As you literally can just look around and see things, uh, what are some object lessons? Well, what came to my mind uh, is something here that I picked up a moment ago of our seeds. Seeds are used in the Bible. Jesus uses them to describe the growth of the Christian, the experience of the Christian, how it starts so small. This is actually a seed from underneath this big tree here from which all of you, practically all of you, are sitting underneath. It's providing shade with its lofty stature and its branches. But it started out really small. It had a beginning that seemed very much insignificant. But by God's grace, it grew and fulfilled a mighty purpose. And so it, it made me think about um, the spiritual application uh, in Luke chapter 8, verse 11. It talks about how the seed is what? The word of God. The seed is the word of God. And how is it that we grow through God's word? Well, in 1 Peter 1, verse 23, it says that we are born again, not of corruptible seeds, but of incorruptible. That is the incorruptible, imperishable word of God. It says, through the word which liveth and abideth forever. So that verse there in 1 Peter 1, 23, helped me to understand what Jesus meant when he was talking to Nicodemus and said, unless a man is born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. And to be born again is to have God's word, his truth, brought into our minds and accepted and received, and it will change us. Will it not? It will change us, and we will grow entirely differently than we would if we did not have God's word introduced into our minds and our hearts. Well, let me ask this fun nature question. How many different seeds are there in the world? Anyone want to throw out a, a, a guess, a, a guesstimate? 400,000 different species of seed plants. 400,000 different types of plants that grow from different types of seeds. Well, what are the largest and the smallest seeds? The smallest seeds are so small, they come from the orchid plants. And I guess there's a variety of orchids. They're so small, the seeds are considered to be like dust. They are dust. And they can blow easily in the wind and be transported and then find their way to where they can grow. Now, what are the largest seeds in the world? The largest seeds are from a, see if I can read what I wrote here, a palm tree called the coco de mer. Coco de mer uh, tree, which can be 12 inches long and weigh 40 pounds. That's one seed. So what a variety. Uh, hundreds of thousands of different uh, plants that grow from seeds and different kinds of seeds. Well, did you know, picking up on that illustration, it doesn't just start with the seed. Did you know in the Bible that people are likened to trees compared to trees? Is that so? Well, uh, in Psalm chapter one, verses one through three, it talks about how a strong, righteous person is like a tree planted by the rivers of water that will grow and prosper in all that it does. And it made me think, what's so significant and special about a tree that God would compare his righteous, faithful followers to a tree? Well, a tree does start small, but it can grow quite large. A tree, a tree doesn't move around and wander all over the place. It stands firm in the place that it was planted. The Christian should stand firm in the place that God plants us. When a, mature, when a tree grows and gets to a mature point, it brings forth fruit. It brings forth something that is a benefit and a blessing to those around it, other animals, other creatures, and, and even people. 
And in particular, there's a tree in the Bible that's mentioned as a special type of tree that really especially represents the righteous, and it's called the cedar of Lebanon. The cedar of Lebanon is a very hardy tree. It will grow, and it's an evergreen tree that when many other trees in wintertime lose their leaves and, and winter overtakes them, as it were, the cedar of Lebanon stands strong and tall with leaves of green. And so it's a special object describing God's people as a tree. It grows and fulfills God's purpose. Well, let me ask a question here for our kids. How long do trees live? How long do trees live? And different trees have different lifespans. Um, does anyone know how old is the oldest tree in the world? Or does anyone know where it's found? Give you a guess. Uh, it's in the country that you're in currently. It's in, okay, California. All right, Will over here. It's specifically, it's in California in the United States. It is a Great Basin bristlecone pine. And very interestingly, it has been named Methuselah. <laughs> Methuselah, which is a Bible name for the person that lived the longest, 969 years. This tree, though, has outlived the human Methuselah. It is estimated, and they supposedly have done core you know, tree samples, and here's their best estimate, 4,855 years old. It is the, it's the, the oldest living organism in the world, in California. And, it, and because it's such a special you know, tree, they don't tell people generally where to find it because they don't want people messing with it, which is probably smart, right? People don't always make the best decisions like picking up black bear cubs and taking selfies with them uh, up in the mountains at Asheville this week. Maybe you saw that on the news. Uh, people are, yeah. I've held baby black bear cubs that were rescued from a mother uh, who uh, had accidentally been shot by the rangers to be examined. They shot her with a, a tranquilizer and she fell down on her face. And as they waited for the tranquilizer to take effect, uh, she suffocated. And so the rangers were just devastated. And uh, she had three cubs and I got to hold them. And even as just newborn cubs, they have like two, three inch long nails. And so they, I had to hold them in a blanket so they wouldn't slash my arms up. So these people that picked up the bear cubs, they don't know what they're doing. All right, back, back to the story, Pastor. Let's get back with it. You know, it just made me think 4,855 years. How long ago was the flood? Right about that same amount of time. If you do the calculations, isn't that interesting? The worldwide flood that Genesis tells us about that covered the entire earth, even the tallest mountain by 30 feet. Very specific. So that tree is about as old as when the flood occurred. Fascinating. Well, um, let's see here. So we're looking at we have seeds and the seed grows up and becomes a tree. But how does the tree grow in a healthy way? Are there any other object lessons that Jesus has given to us? Yes, in John chapter 15, he says, I am the vine, you are the what? The branches, you can see branches out here. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do how much? Nothing. You can do nothing. And so John 15 this is Jesus speaking shortly before he was uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane and his trial and execution. And he's giving a powerful picture of abide in me and I in you. As the, the branch cannot bring forth fruit or live apart from the vine, neither can you survive and function and live apart from me. And I mean, how obvious would it be to look up here and think all these branches, of course they can't live if they're disconnected from the tree, the main trunk. Of course, that's so obvious. And in a similar way, it should be so obvious. Of course, if I'm not connected constantly to Jesus through his word, through devotions and spending time with him on a regular daily basis, I'm not going to have his life in me. I'm not going to have his words, his His promises and, and his vital energy, the Holy Spirit, which is transmitted through the word of God. It won't be connected to me because I'm not connected to him. So it should be obvious, but Jesus really unpacks that, that true growth, and we might call this a big theological term, sanctification, 
the, the process of becoming like Jesus, that happens as I stay connected to him on a regular, not just daily basis, once a day, but moment by moment. At all times, I am not safe or secure unless I am connected to Jesus. And so when I'm connected to him, we will grow. He invites us to come to him and find the life that he offers to us. He says in John 10, 10, the thief comes not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I have come, Jesus says, that they might have life and that they might have it how? Have it to the fullest, greatest extent. And that includes, brothers and sisters, not just physical life, but maybe most importantly, that includes spiritual, eternal, salvational life and having it more abundantly. That is the plan and the purpose of Jesus. So how do we abide in him? In the same way that we begin, in the same way that seed, that little seed is planted in our minds of truth as a symbol of something that can grow. That's the beginning of a life with Jesus. And when I place his words and I take time to think and even by his grace, ask him to help me apply that to my life. Whatever he says, those words will grow up and spring up and give everlasting life. We'll have two minutes. And so I'm going to close with a short story about a large tree that uh, I had a chance to visit in 2021 in California called the General Sherman. How many of you have seen this tree before? The General Sherman It's a giant sequoia. It is the largest tree in the world by volume. So we have the oldest tree is in California and the largest tree that has the most volume. Uh, uh, and it's also very tall. It's almost as tall as the Statue of Liberty, which is pretty amazing to think of a tree that big. But anyway, uh, this tree, which is estimated to be around 2,500 years old, that would be back before Jesus lived on earth. Pretty amazing to go back. That, that's back to uh, ancient Greece and the, the, the golden age of it. That's history, though. But anyway, uh, this tree, after we visited our family, we were driving out to California to take our son back to school at Weimar in Northern California, and we drove through to visit some national parks. After we were there... Just weeks later, a huge forest fire came through. The KNP complex forest fire, several fires joined together because of a lightning strike. It was hot, it was dry, and all it takes is a lightning strike to just set off all this wood. And it started this massive fire, and it was burning so close to the, uh, the trees there that the rangers were very worried that it was gonna get you know, burned and it would be lost. This tree that's lived for thousands of years and so they did everything they could to protect it, and they wrapped around the base. And the whole base of the tree is over 100 feet, like 103 feet. So just imagine 103 feet just to wrap a blanket of aluminum foil all around it, like 20 feet high, so that the fire, when it got up close to it, it would be resistant to, you know, it doesn't burn in aluminum. So they were hoping that would help the tree. There's my alarm. Okay, time to be done. Anyway. Uh, long story short, uh, they did everything they could to save the tree. And what's unique, though, about this tree, uh, the, this is the point. Uh, God created this tree in a special way. Its bark is like 12 inches thick, and it is resistant to burn, to burning. It, in other words, it doesn't catch fire easily. It's not very flammable. And so that has protected these trees that grow to these lofty statures for many years because there have been many other fires that have come before, and it has survived. And I thought, what a, a wonderful illustration of how God wants us to be, how he promises to protect us and to, to help us when we pass through challenges or difficulties. If we grow strong in him, he promises that he will take care of us no matter what storms come. And so there's a verse in Isaiah 43 and verse 2 that says this, when thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. That means you don't have to worry about being drowned or overwhelmed by the water. And then it says this, when thou passest through the fire, what's the rest of the verse? Thou shalt not be burned, for I am with you to deliver you. And so just like God, you know, created the tree and gave it some properties to be protected. And then he, of course, you know, protected it with the forest rangers and so on. He will protect us. He has given us the ability to withstand these challenges that we face in life in his strength and with his help. So all of that is taken from the lesson of a seed that grows to a tree 
that grow strong, connected to Jesus, and he will provide and take care of all of our needs if we just keep our hand of faith and trust in him. Let's bow our heads for a closing prayer. Oh, Father in heaven, thank you for such a beautiful day, uh, such a beautiful temperature, uh, the gentle breeze, um, and allergies don't seem to be that bad. Uh, Lord, we pray that this would be uh, a blessing to everyone who could come and just really separate apart from our regular schedule and focus on you. As we've just considered just a few small examples in the Bible of natural objects that you have given to us that contain a spiritual lesson, I pray, Lord, that we would continue to abide and trust and have faith in you, that we would grow strong and be able to bear fruit to the blessing of God, to the blessing of those around us, to give honor and glory to you. So please, may your presence be with us, may your Holy Spirit be with us, and may we be revived and renewed by our fellowship and our worship today. This is my humble and earnest prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to take uh, a few minutes uh, intermission. So there are bathrooms right here, and there's tons of water. I brought several cases of water, so if you're thirsty, come up and just...